Jesus literally was not the first human divine creature. Everybody is a human divine creature. Jesus was unique in that his assignment was unique. God, we sing it and we pray it. Take not your Holy Spirit from us and create in us a clean heart. Restore a right spirit within us. It's so easy, oh God, with the cruelty of times and the struggles of the day to be bitter and to be bothered and to be struggling in our soul, even to believe. But create in us, oh God, a clean heart. Meet us again in the preaching moment. Help us, oh God, to say what you want to say to your people. Give me clarity of thought and your people clarity of hearing. Call our attention in as we turn toward the text. Be pleased today with our worship and even more pleased with our living. I pray this, O oh God, in the name of all that's holy, in the presence of our ancestors, and in the strong name of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Good afternoon to you, Alfred Street. Um, thank you again, Pastor Wesley, for those kind words of introductions. I should say, I have been waiting to say to the last service, that's all good. Y'all do shout if the word moves you, but he still has to do the work. <laughs> yes, Lord. He's already had an experience that made him go, oh my, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that, that, I, I don't believe in um, the hazing that some PhD work is, but I do think it is the role of that committee to bring the best out of you. And if they do that right, then, because that's really, as far as I'm concerned, the role of the PhD committee, and I hope to see your best work come out of that. It's, he's capable, he's more than capable. I wanna make another confession before I turn my attention to, to the word. Dr. Judy was here in the last service and we turned to each other and confessed, oh, I think, yeah, at the altar, some sisters were coming to the altar and I, I looked at her and I said, I must confess I have dress envy. There are few folk I want parts of their wardrobe. <laughs> I said, I got to confess. She said, I must confess I have shoe envy. <laughs> and so we prayed for each other around that. <laughs> you are some good looking people. <laughs> that's, that's my other way of saying that. It was a joy. It has been a joy this whole weekend to be with you all. I've been very thankful for Alfred Street for hosting Woman Preach. Uh, some of us are still here. Yes, y'all got to stand up one more time. Um, Stand up now. <laughs> uh, these are our, um, you can be seated. I, I've just been very thankful for the people that God has sent into this ministry in the eight years that we have been in existence. And last night as we were at dinner, I, I was struck again by the way out of no way that God has helped us do this work. We have not had very much money, and this is not a plea for money. I ain't gonna be mad at you if you give, but that's not why I'm saying this. We have not had much money, but we've had some very gifted people and some very dedicated people to do this work and some women and men who've wanted to get good at preaching the gospel and telling the truth and shaping it in such a way that people could hear. And so I'm blessed by that, and I've been blessed by them. We received a uh, grant from the Forum for Theological Exploration, 
very small grant a couple of years ago, allowed us to bring five young women on to be our, to be our mentees. And I keep saying they have mentored us way more than we mentored them. And out of that, we got a, um, we got a program manager. And so Janae is a force to be reckoned with. I think I'm going to take her around with me everywhere. So when people ask me questions, I'm going to say, ask Janae. <laughs> like, she's been a blessing. So it's been a blessing for you all to host us and to help us in this work. You've been a blessing to us. I want you to know that. I want you to know that and that we are appreciative for how you've been a blessing to us. Let's turn our attention now to this word. The text, the last one that I will read is from John, the second chapter, 13 through 22. The four texts that I have preached from, this being the fourth, have all come from the third week of Lent, the Lenten season lectionary text. Exodus 20, the 10 words or the Decalogue as you know them by 1 Corinthians 1, the text about being foolish, Psalm 19, where we get our testimonies and the ways in which testimonies show up, and then this final odd text out of John, John 2, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, okay, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After that, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Thus ends the reading of the word. May you be seated in the presence of God. I call this an odd text for a reason. It's an odd text. That's why I called it odd. We, we read this text. It's one version of four told in the, in the Gospels. This is John. The Synoptic Gospels tell this same story very differently. Matthew, Mark, and, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell it very differently. And they place it editorially at the end of Jesus's ministry. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke suggest to us, in fact, tell us that this is one of the reasons that they were gunning for Jesus and one of the reasons he ended up crucified because of what he did that day in the temple according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, however, is not one of the synoptic gospels and does not intend to be telling the same kind of story as they are telling. John's gospel, in case you don't know, is not actually intended to be anything more than a theological treatise. What I mean by that is though John is telling stories out of Jesus' life, he does not care to put them in chronological order because he is making a theological point and not a historical one. And so this story that in the other gospels is at the end of the story, John, the Johannine tradition, puts it at the very beginning of his life, of his life, his public life, of his preaching life. John, you might remember, as a gospel, does not have a birth story of any kind as it relates to Jesus. It begins with Jesus being full 
overgrown. That's another reason you know that John is not concerned about the historical data, but how these stories shape the understanding of the community that holds these stories in place. John is the latest gospel written. Much has happened. All of the disciples, by the time the Johannine story gets told, have been crucified, have, def- have been martyred, have been killed in some way or another. And so when you get the Gospel of John, they're really trying to answer something that is at the end of John. John 20 and 30 says, these things are written so that you may believe. Well, the first thing it says is there are many things done in the life of Jesus that are not written, that if they were written, the world could not contain. This is why I think the saints ought to understand that the Bible is a guide, but it is not all that God has done. Because... Many things happened in the life of Jesus, offline, if you will, not on Twitter, if you must, that you cannot put in 140 characters. There are things about the life of Jesus and the way Jesus showed up in the world that are important, that are signs that point us to God, but are only signs that point us to God. John, as a matter of fact, had seven such signs. One of them is in this chapter. John does not use the word miracle in the same way that the Synoptic Gospels does. They call everything a miracle. The feeding of the 5,000 in John is called a sign, a samea, a sign of something that God is doing, literally a pointing to where God is going. In other words, in the Gospel of John, Everything is written to point you toward what God is doing in the world and beyond. And so in the chapter that this is in, the earliest sign in the, in the Gospel of John is at the wedding of Cana. Y'all remember this? It, it, just nod if you, you know, you like punch a neighbor to the side and say, tell me later if you don't know. Uh, but, but, but the first sign is the turning of water into wine. Now, we've been singing this stupid song all weekend, drink another wine, wine. Y'all don't, y'all don't know that? Y'all not, Bap- y'all not old Baptists. That's an old Baptist thing. But, but that sign of, of Jesus doing more than is expected at any given time is a hint <clears throat> to how God shows up. Right after that is this story. Think about that. <clears throat> if, you are, if you are a literary person, you know that plot matters, right? So here's the plot. The plot is that Jesus comes into our neighborhood. That's first, John, first chapter of John. Full of grace and glory, puts on a body. People don't recognize him. He comes to his own, and his own doesn't receive him because they don't recognize him as divinity wrapped in flesh. Who would do that? Because who knows what that is? He's a rare and strange alien, if you will, trans in every kind of possible way, part holy, part human. And here he is saying, and this is what God looks like like not just in me but also in you I know that he means to say it looks like this in you too because way back in Genesis when God was breathing into dirt it was divine breath going into just mud Jesus literally was not the first human divine creature everybody is a human divine creature. Jesus was unique in that his assignment was unique. He became very much the body that would bear all of what God wanted to show us. But he was not alone. And so you get this weird story. Weird story. I know it's a weird story because I grew up in the country. This, this summer, with a group of, of preachers, we decided to read through the Bible. 
in, in 30 days. Not 30, 90 days, I'm sorry. I lost my mind. <laughs> that did not happen. 90 days. It was torturous. We preachers, it was torturous. So I understand if you have not done this as a lay person, we would be reading along and we would be like, what the world? It was odd. Stories were odd. Strange things happening. One of the things that I got caught by was that as you're reading through the laws, as you're reading through the Levitical codes, which are the priestly laws, they count all the animals that have to be sacrificed from every tribe. You know, so many sheep and so many bulls and so many he rams, and they number them, and each tribe has to bring one, and they tell you exactly how they're supposed to be sacrificed and on exactly what altar in the temple, and they lay it out. And as we're reading through this, and it's mind numbing because it's over and over and over. It's the at least 12 times they say it for the same number for all the tribes and we were like oh my god but at some point it clicked into me and I thought all of the sacrifice were shared among the people they ate the sacrifice there were only so many sacrifices that were burnt whole all the rest of the sacrifice was like a large picnic and the people would gather and eat after the offering was made, after it was roasted on the altar. And, and so the temple was supposed to be not just the place where they did the ritual, but the place where they shared their common life and where everybody ate no matter what the sacrifice was that they brought. So some people could not afford to bring a ram or a sheep or cattle. They could only afford the dove or the pigeon, really, the, the bird. No, really, as the, as the fellowship sacrifice. That's all they could afford to bring and usually they had caught it along the way as they were making their way to the temple but the goal was that once they got to the temple it didn't matter who brought what sacrifice everybody was going to get a piece of whatever was dished out do you get where I'm going here and so we're reading through the Levitical text and we're reading then we get to Deuteronomy and we're reading and again, they're doing all the sacrifice. And my pastor says, nobody should have been hungry in ancient Israel. Because it says, do this for the poor, do that for the poor. And we're going, why is anybody poor if people can bring this much bloody sacrifice to the altar? What you see in reading that is there was more than enough for everybody. But what happened in the temple complex is what often happens when people are deciding about power. Some people got more, and some people got pigeon legs. Not because that was the way it was supposed to be, but you know how we are as humans. There's a system in place that's supposed to help everybody, but really, power concedes nothing without a demand. And, and so by the time you get to this story in John, or John's rendering of this story, John doesn't say what the other disciples say, what Matthew, Mark, Luke say about it being a den of thieves. He doesn't even accuse them of stealing from the people. He basically say, y'all have lost the meaning of this ritual. You've lost what this means for us to be here in this place together. Now, I need you to get your sanctified imagination. The temple mount and all around the temple stinks. I, I know we have cleaned this story up, but I grew up on a farm. And the animals poop where they poop. 
and there were no dog poopers to pick it up and put it in bags. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. There was none of that. So the temple smells like all these animals and it's full of all these animals because the temple is not like this church. It's not enclosed in. The animals literally can walk through the temple complex and nobody's stopping them because they're the sacrifice. They're going to die. They might as well enjoy their last few days free. <laughs> they about to become barbecue. It's all good. <laughs> and, and, and so the temple complex is full of all of this bustle and hustle and honest to God there's nothing wrong with the animals being there so oftentimes we read this scripture and we say well Jesus was upset that they were changing money in the temple not really because some poor people couldn't bring their animals from far off they only came to the Temple Mount twice a year. Otherwise, they were doing their sacrifices in high places, which you know the prophets hated, but they couldn't make it. They were not rich enough. They couldn't afford the trip. I think about this myself because of my privileges of traveling, and sometimes, particularly when I'm doing protests, I think to myself, I don't have to travel to protest because there's something happening right where I am that needs my attention, but it's more exotic to travel and to show up to the March on Washington for poor people that no poor people could attend. <laughs> right? So, so, so here they are. At this temple, most of these people are privileged because most of the poor people on the countryside couldn't get there. The closest people that could get there who were poor brought their pigeons, but everybody else hoped to God that people were making offerings and sacrifices for them and on their behalf. And I wonder sometimes if we remember that not everybody can do what we are called to do and if we're doing what we need to make the kind of sacrifices on other people's behalf because they can't do it. I just wonder about this. These are the things that make me go, mm. Jesus, this really weird story. I call it weird because... He comes in, he sees them, he's been to the temple many times, many times he's been to the temple, and it says he makes a cord out of, a whip out of cord. Y'all saw that in the text? He made, now, I don't know what kind of cord you get that's going to whip out all them cattle and all those sheep because I grew up on a farm, and I know that uh, you hit a bull is not smart not smart you just excite them incite them make them mad irritate them running is not on their agenda at that point so imagine Jesus has a whip and we probably have it really nice at this point until he gets to the money changers get out of here little she what kind of crazy is going on in the temple while all these animals now are confused because this rabbi prophet from out on the countryside shows up and disrupt what is the right thing for them to be doing, which is making sacrifices. This is why the people are like, what are you doing? What is your sign that this is the right thing to do? Have you lost your mind? That's, that's why, because they're not doing anything from their perspective wrong. They're following the law, except people are still hungry and people are still in need while they're making their sacrifices, while they're doing the right thing, while they're following the law. People are still struggling. So Jesus comes in and he does this and you know, uh, Dr. Um, Michael Brown preached on this text recently, and he was like, do y'all really believe this? Like, this is the weirdest story in the Bible. Jesus comes in and starts throwing over money changer tables. 
early in his ministry, which means he was young. Like he was Black Lives Matter young. I'm trying to help you understand <laughs> what I'm talking about here. And all the elders sitting there looking at him like, boy, is you lost your mind. He was young, and they were like, what in the world is going on? Have you, where's your home training? Have you never been in a temple? This is not a pretty story. Like, we like that. We like the Jesus in the temple person. But, but this kind of stuff will get you killed. Right now, the young people from Parkland are, are, are you know, raising up a ruckus, and thank God they are. I ain't got nothing to say about that. But I saw somebody post, I am really offended that people are trying to punish them. I'm like, but protest gets you killed. Resistance cost. Coming against systems that have been in place for hundreds and thousands of years cost you something. John put this at the front of his ministry so that you would know that he was always going to the cross because he started disruptive. Jesus didn't start nice and pretty and kind. He didn't have, he was not, um, he was not the favorite child. I know Luke says he grew in grace and favor with God and people, but from John's perspective, this boy came in tearing stuff up. <laughs> from John's perspective, he was a problem to start with. And from John's perspective, when he says, I'm going to raise this temple in three days, you know, God is going to be in my flesh. From John's perspective, that's what God was calling John's community to, to be just as disruptive as Jesus. From John's perspective, this story sets all of us up. None of us get to be nice. From John's perspective, none of us get to be the good guy or the good girl from John's perspective. From John's perspective, the zeal of God's house ought to consume us, so much so till we break out of our habits and start building the kind of community that the ritual was supposed to be about. This text, this text, where Jesus comes in and he starts turning over the table and the money, running the money changers. I can't really see all them grown men running from Jesus, but that's what John say happened, so I'm going to repeat it for y'all. I can't see it, but they start running, and they probably, because, you know, he running around with a whip. They probably like, boy, what is wrong with you? you it's like, put that whip down. Where is your mama? What are you doing? That really is the disruption that John is calling the church to have. The kind that makes people sit up and take notice and go, what is you doing? What is wrong with you? And to have somebody else say, the zeal of God has consumed me. Now, the title of the sermon is Get Out. So let me explain how I got to the title, because I know I know you I know you're like, what in the world has that got? So here he is suggesting to them by his very action that yes, come to the temple and do this, but at some point you gotta get out and all those people that you left on the countryside and in the streets that are uh, lame and blind and deaf and all, who are who are unable by our definitions to come into this temple. This little picnic has to break out of this temple. People have to know that God is not contained in this building, but in this building. He said, so when he says 46 years they've been building this temple, what is wrong with you? He said in three day, days this building will be destroyed and it will get back up. And the way the building of God gets back up in Jesus is us. We're the body of Christ. 
we're the resurrected body of Christ. And John told us that from the very beginning of the story so that you would be ready for the crucifixion, so you, you would be ready for people calling you out of your name, so you would be ready for people asking, is this not Joseph's son? So you would be ready for the back talk, so you would be ready for the backlash. He told us from the very beginning that this temple, the building, is cool. It smells like animals. It's cool. But the temple that God cares about is the one that got raised from the dead long before it got crucified. Long before it got crucified. So cosmically, for John's sake, we are supposed to be making our way out of the temple all the time. This picnic, this barbecue, this sacrifice, this ritual has to go into the countryside to those people who couldn't make it to this temple because they don't have the means to make it to this temple. Because this temple, the one that has taken you 46 years to build, is not the one that matters. Not that the rituals themselves are bad, but that there is a temple not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There's a temple that is our body that carries the very glory and grace of God. And until we break out of this temple, the one that it took them 46 years to build, until you break out of this church, the one that you love so well and I ain't mad at you about it, but until we break out, until we get out the sign that the people were asking about will never be seen. What sign will you show us? Jesus said, I'm going to get up. That's the sign. And I wonder today, I wonder today if you are the sign you're supposed to be. I wonder if you are the very presence of God in the earth, not just temple. Coming to church is fine and good and well, and I recommend it to everybody, especially if the choir is going to sing like this every Sunday. I recommend it to people. But the point of coming to church is not coming to church. Any more than bringing the ritual, the point of the ritual was bringing the ritual. The point of the ritual was feeding the people. The point of the ritual was breaking down the walls of division between poor and rich, those who had and did not have. That was the whole point of the ritual, so that nobody lacked in the presence of God. That was the whole point of the ritual. The point of coming to church is not to show off your good clothes, although I love them and I want some of them. That's not the point. The point is to come to fill up so that we can get out of here and break outside these walls and change the way the world around us experience God. You can turn over all the tables you want to, but the coins can be recollected. But until the coins are redistributed, it doesn't matter how many tables you turn over. If all you're going to do is just pick the table back up and set it back up and keep doing what you've been doing, then you miss the point of Jesus even asking them to get out of the temple. Take this money outside here. There are folk right on the side of the road that need you. Take this money out of here. There are people right down the road that need you, he says. Take this money right out of here. Move that table outside the door. There are folk outside the temple that can't even walk into the temple because they can't get into the temple. Get out of here!
I believe, I believe, I believe that as we are marching our way toward the cross this Lenten season, I believe that in this third week of the Lenten season where we are thinking about what sacrifices we are going to give, what kind of offerings we are going to make, what kind of rituals we are going to keep, that the point isn't just to make the offering, to make the sacrifice, to keep the ritual, but to do it in such a way that our bodies bear in them the very death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that we become the sign and symbol to the world of what God is doing. One day in not too many days coming, we're going to celebrate Easter but not until we've gone through Good Friday and this story at the very beginning of John signifies that you got to go through something to get to where God is in our lives through Jesus Christ. You can't have a cross a crown without a cross. You can't. You can't. And this text invites us to get outside of these walls with the very rituals that make us a part of the people of God and take them to the rest of the world so that they too can encounter the Christ who said three days later, three days later, and when... He had died and gotten up, and the Johannine people were gathered together, probably in a sacred meal, because that was usual among the early temples, and maybe even hiding from those who were at the time persecuting uh, Christians. They believed him. They remembered his words, and they believed the words that he had spoken. Let me end by saying, as we prepare to get out, the only way we're going to do that is if we have this encounter with the not yet dead Christ who will become the risen Christ and we begin to believe the word even before we see it all put in the place. When we can believe, when we the body of Christ can believe, then we can lead other people to believe. When we can believe that it bears, we bear the sign and symbol of God in us then we'll take these rituals and turn them inside out and take them into the world and become the people of God that we are called to be when we believe what God has said when we remember what God has done when we remember what God has done and when we remember what God has said we'll turn it inside out and we'll get outside of these walls and be the body of Christ get out